Hill, we're, we're at a very special place here, uh, connecting uh, sort of that side of town to the downtown area, and we've got Shoal Creek right behind us. Talk a little bit about the historical context and importance of where we're at right now. Well, uh, this is really one of the most important parts of downtown and its connection to the Lady Bird Lake Trail, the Shoal Creek Trail, because they intersect right here. And people have had a vision for this being a significant trail uh, nexus for a long time. Um, there are great visions, but it's a lot of infrastructure work and it's gonna require quite a bit of an investment to make it happen. Um, the political will has not been there for some time. There have been different visions floated multiple times over the last 30 years. And, but I think now the Shoal Creek Trail Conservancy has a vision that people in the community are buying into. City Council is in support of it. It's moving through a design process and it is going to completely transform how this road connects, how people are able to cross Shoal Creek to get into the Sea Home development, which is a new, very popular development. A lot of people living there. And I think a lot of that is because of just the increase in population downtown. Um, 20 years ago, there were a few hundred people living downtown. Right. Now, the last number I saw was something like 25,000 people are living downtown. And with all the new development of condominiums, apartments that are going up downtown, there will be several tens of thousands more people living down here in the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, it's also a entertainment nexus, lots of restaurants, lots of uh, nightlife activity. So there's just a buzz going almost 24 seven down in this area. And it, it is not built out to really accommodate a, a living in the community outside on the trail, along the creek, along the lake, but the vision is there and it's gonna come to fruition. That's great, yeah. And as we'll find out in just a moment, cause we're gonna roll down the Third Street Protected Bikeway, yeah. this is a critical connector. And yeah. right now we have that little pinch point right over there. <laughs> it's a little <laughs> Where tight. we all get real in there. That's right. And, and it's okay, you know, because we're, we're courteous bike riders. We slow down, we recognize that yeah. everybody's gotta share that space. Yeah. At least we're not having to share it with automobiles too. That's exactly right. <laughs> and you know, I think that's the beauty of it. That there's very little social conflict down in this very densely used area yeah. because people do recognize that it's for everybody to, to visit. People are walking their dogs down here. They're pushing their kids strollers and they're riding through at the same time and everybody's coexisting extremely well. All right. All right. Let's go ride this uh, okay. Dutch inspired protected Yay. bike lane. I can tell already we're going to get wind from the the high rises, you know, the way it blasting, channels it down channels here, it yeah, down on us, yeah. This has been around here for a while, you know? This, this has been, yeah. This, this has been in place ever it's since been, we arrived. Been here you know? now over 10 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it I think it went in, what was it, right in 2013? Or even prior to that. Uh, no, it would have been, been 2013. Yeah, yeah. you're right, John. Yeah. <laughs> I know sections of it were still being worked on when we got here at the end of 2014. Yeah.
So Hill, we just rolled down a pretty extraordinary facility for the city of Austin. Uh, this is a Dutch inspired protected bike lane. It's parking protected, but it's also got significant infrastructure uh, protection. You and I were talking as we were rolling down it that we think it's been around for just about a decade for now. For about a decade, yeah. 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 This was also one of the first Green Lane projects that, mm -hmm. that the city initiated. Mm -hmm. um, it's called the Lance Armstrong Bikeway. Mm -hmm. It is the, the significant east-west crosstown bikeway that goes through the densest part of the city, and it's used by several hundred cyclists every day. Yeah, um, and it is one of the most phenomenal facilities. Of course, right now with all the construction that's going on in Austin, there's a lot of disruption to, right. to the path. There's a couple of places that it's actually been blocked, and you have to go into the lane of traffic. Yep. Um, but some of the development has accommodated the LA, the the Crosstown Bikeway, yeah. and allowed it to to continue and work around it. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but but I think what's most important about this is just again demonstrating to the city at large that we can build facilities like this, we can make cycling and active transportation safe. Scooterists are using it on yep. a regular basis. Everybody is using it. And um, I, I just think it's key to building out a strong network within the city is to have these big backbones, these spines that can connect the rest of the city to it. Yeah. Now, and we're at the intersection uh, with Congress Avenue. So we're at Third yeah. Street and Congress Avenue. And this is a significant intersection. And uh, we see that right now we have some uh, interim uh, protection in the uh, protected uh, intersection here, which came along during the pandemic yeah. uh, at, at direction of city council yeah. to, to create some more space for people walking and biking, taking a little bit of pressure off of the, the sidewalks. Talk a little bit about, you know, that process. And, you know, I, you've been around, you've been at this for four decades here in the city. So, I mean, that's a pretty significant thing that, that happened during that period of time and how quickly this interim facility got slapped down. Well, I think that was one of the, the great benefits. There, while there weren't a lot of benefits to the, the pandemic, this is one of the biggest benefits. But, but really, I think it's a demonstration of the community's ability to organize and to speak to the city leadership about what the city needs to do to make cycling, walking, getting around via active transportation safer in the city of Austin. Yep. And this was a result of Safe Streets Austin or Bike Austin at the time, really getting the community together, sending hundreds of emails to city council asking them to put protected facilities on Congress Avenue. There had been two unfor unfortunate crash deaths on Congress Avenue in the previous two years. Cyclists that were hit by inebriated drivers on the roadway, people that were working in a pedicab, and somebody that was coming home from a job working downtown. Uh, at two o'clock in the morning was, was hit by an inebriated driver. One of the things that we know is happening is that the, the city has been grappling with trying to completely redesign Congress Avenue and reimagine yeah. what Congress Avenue is. And so when I saw this kind of happening, I thought, oh, wow, you know, th this is kind of happening because we knew that there's going to be, this is an interim step towards something that's going to, Congress Avenue will hopefully look much different and be much more people oriented in the future. That's right. I, I think that it could go a couple of different ways. You know, of course, there's a lot of competing interests. Mm -hmm. When we look at a main boulevard like Congress Avenue, which is really the iconic uh, highway in Texas, right. because it leads right up to the state capitol uh, from the lake. It's just, it's, it's a beautiful stretch of roadway. Um, but there's a lot of business interests. There's a lot of property owner interests. Um, and there are people that want to see it stay basically the way that it is today. Um, mm -hmm. Business owners that want the parking in front of their, their building. But I think if we look at a lot of the things that are happening in other major cities around the world, that they are taking streets like this and completely shutting them down right. and making them pedestrian boulevards. And it is bringing so much life and vitality to that area that the benefit to the business and the property owners is, is just enormous. Yeah. And I think it's a leap for our community to think about doing something that radical, but I think that it really ought to be seriously considered because it would transform the, the value of this downtown real estate and the way that people use it, the, the reason they're attracted to being down here because nobody wants to come down here and hang out with a bunch of, of trucks and cars on the street. Yeah. 
Yeah. Right on cue, the loud truck. Uh-huh. Right on cue. <laughs> okay, well, let's roll on down and check out this facility's inner, uh, really, uh, interaction with and connection to the transit. Yeah. All right, cool. let's do it. I always like getting that transition yeah, right. on camera. Oh, there's a classic. Sure is. That's awesome. All right. This is cool. This is cool. <laughs> so this is the convention center and the downtown station for the lot rail. Amazing. I love it. Pretty dynamic. Let's, uh, just... We'll go ahead and pull up off to the side since we got such wind in our face. Okay, yeah. So Hill, as you were saying, uh, this is our downtown station and we, we just rode all the way from that neighborhood way up in the east or west side of town there, uh, all the way to here on high comfort facilities. Yeah. Uh, as we were rolling through there, maybe the, it didn't come out in the sound, but I said, how cool is this? <laughs> you know, I think it's really amazing that we're seeing this transition in Austin um, that, that I heard a, a transportation engineer refer to about 10 years ago. And he was talking about so many communities have these enormous islands that are safe cycling. So you've got a big neighborhood, you've got a big section of the town where you could pretty much ride anywhere. Your six-year-old, your 88-year-old could get on their bicycle and feel safe because they're on slow speed neighborhood streets and there's very little uh, dangerous traffic any place. But then you have these shark infested waters right. that have to be crossed to get to the next safe part of town. Yeah. And what we're seeing with facilities like this is it's connecting those shark, it's transversing those shark filled waters with a safe facility so that the whole city can be connected safely. Yeah. And as you mentioned earlier with uh, Metro, uh, you know, now taking over uh, the B cycle program, we now have that integration of the transit line with the active mobility. And so you can get off the train station here, jump on a, a, a bike, a metro, you know, a metro bike, uh, right. e-assist metro bike. That's right. Trek with Bosch Motors, uh, and and be able to make it to your meaningful destination, whatever yeah. that may be. Whether you're coming for work or for play, a little bit of music. This is awesome. You bet. After Absolutely. All. <laughs> but people are traveling at two o'clock in the morning all over town on bicycles. Yeah. Because it's a safe, easy way to get around. You don't have to deal with the parking hassle, yeah. and uh, the people are becoming increasingly comfortable. Yeah. So the other key thing that you just mentioned there was that it's about connectivity, connecting neighborhoods together. And that's exactly what we're going to see here in a moment. We're going to go underneath one of our biggest barricades that we have yeah. in, in our city, uh, in I-35. And, uh, and it has some historical context to the barrier that it has uh, created, dividing our city. But we do have a relatively safe connection uh, under that barrier. So yes, let's go do that safe. and we're going to see some really cool stuff on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> So at some level, I know that this has got to be, you're kind of, you're pinching yourself going, it, it is amazing how much has changed. I in mean, obviously, years, in it, just yeah, 10 years, in just 10 years, it really yeah. is. Because it's, it's, it's been a, it's been a multi-decade fight, but in the last 10 years, it's been amazing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yep. And you know, when you you think about the uh, <clears throat> the way that the community has supported the bond elections that have mm -hmm. funded the build out of all this infrastructure, people in Austin get it that we have to pay for these facilities if we're going to be able to build them, enjoy them, and what an asset it is for everyone within the community to have these facilities. Yeah. When you see a, a bond election passing with 67% of the electorate approving it, you know there's pretty strong sentiment that we want to see more of this. So yeah. I'm optimistic that every four to six years we're going to fund another active transportation bond and this city is going to be one of the best places to ride a bicycle, uh, walk, just to get around town without having to drive a car. Yeah. And I even tell folks that, you know, I think that in, not only will it be one of the best in North America, that it could be one of the best worldwide at some point in time. Yeah, it's got the potential for it. Yeah. We see a little bit of uh, an intervention going on right there. That's all about making the that turn, that interaction, a little bit less complicated with it now being a one-way instead of it being a two-way. And that was a really big change. Yeah. It was such a simple change. But when it happened, I'm like, oh my God, that is just absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Because it made it safer for people in cars as well as people on bikes or on foot. Yeah. And it's of course just that getting used to it. I have seen a couple of people going the wrong way. Oh it. yeah, yeah. But yeah. Uh, but but people figure it out and adapt pretty yeah. quickly. Change. That's right. Actually, let's go ahead and turn left here. Okay. All right. When we talk about places for people and you know streets for people and everything yeah it's like we, we see the the street here behind us and we see a street that you know you know, continued through but didn't really do a whole heck of a lot right, right here you know it just went you know a half walk a block there and then didn't really go up that hill it, it looked dead like ended. that hill it dead yeah, ended that's right and so why not make it a little paseo a little people oriented place yeah. for these residences here I mean, this is what we're seeing in terms of trans transition and transformation that is happening. Yeah. It's not just about bikes. It's it, it's not about bikes, folks. It's it's really about creating livable places for people. That's right. And it, this is a, another fun example that I like to use right off of the bike path. Yeah. That Absolutely. gets you to transit. So it's not about the bikes, but it is about creating uh, better land use patterns and more you know more places for people yeah and, and i think that's what's so exciting is we're really starting to rethink all the land that we have allocated to automobiles mm -hmm. and going but is that the right proportionment that automobiles need that people need for just living space and so the the, the value proposition is changing in a lot of people's minds in a really significant way and when you see places like this that on a weekend would be full of people and their dogs hanging out. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's a very exciting change yeah. In, yeah. in the culture of the United States. Yeah, yeah. Well, walk with me here, because we're, okay. we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna just kind of have this be our backdrop and see that, yeah, this is exactly how close we are in these residences. We also have a grocery store here now. There's, There's a, a Whole Target Foods here. there, a Target there. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so what we're really talking about is opportunities, especially for young professionals. They're trying to get started. It's a, this is a very, very expensive city. And yeah. so having easy access to the downtown, to job opportunities, to entertainment opportunities. And oh, by the way, within easy walking and biking and scootering distance. Yeah. And the great thing is a lot of people think, I don't need to own an automobile. Mm -hmm. So I can save myself that $7,500 to $15,000 a year that I was spending on a car payment and gas and insurance and everything else. And I can use that money to buy a great pedal assist bicycle. And I can also 
take a trip to Hawaii. Right. So yeah. I can do all those great things and not be burdened with an automobile. Good choice. Let's, yeah. let's support the Hawaiian economy. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, we're running out of time okay. a little bit, but we're going to go um, to City Hall and talk a little bit more deeply about uh, that process of trying to fund these types of facilities. Uh, they're not cheap but they are dirt cheap compared to automobile right. infrastructure. But we're gonna talk a little bit about what it takes to create uh, community support to be able to get bonds passed. Cool. I saw a guy pulling a trailer this weekend with about a 120-pound uh, Great Pyrenees. Oh, wow. This dog was so big, he could barely fit in the trailer. Yeah, yeah. And he was having such a good time. Oh, I bet. He was baying. Ooh. Dogs love Just bikes. having a blast. <laughs>
Cool. So we are actually now um, on Second Street. What's so important about Second Street? What does this represent for the city? Well, it's a great streets project, and um, this street was being redeveloped. So the city said this would be a perfect opportunity to implement the Great Streets Project, which was part of city, uh, city building regulations that were put in place about 15 years ago. Um, there had not been a lot of change in the downtown area, but now there's rapid change, so we're starting to see more of this. But it is a wide sidewalk that will accommodate living on the street, basically living on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. You can see all the seating. There are multiple restaurants, uh, little cafes that are along the street. So it, at night, you will see hundreds of people down here because it's an entertainment district, mm -hmm. and uh, it's just a lovely place to hang out. There's, inter, uh, there's a, a big theater here, the ACL Live, where thousands of people will go to a show on any given evening, mm -hmm. and you just see throngs of people hanging out down here. So yeah. very livable. So what did this street look like before this transformation happened? Oh, it was a bedraggled, I mean, it just basically had abandoned buildings for all practical purposes mm -hmm. down in this area. Yeah. And uh, it's it's just been completely transformed. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it it's not gentrified because it is so livable and it's so open to the public. Right. It's really a community space. And I suspect that if we looked, we could find some streets that look like what this street looked like before. <laughs> Just a few blocks away. Yeah, so talk yeah. about that, because this was a transformation of multi-lane, one-way streets, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, the city was very bold in putting in a single lane either direction and really limiting the parking on this mm -hmm. street. And I think a lot of the business interests were very alarmed by the fact that there was so little parking. But then there's parking garages in almost all of these buildings because they're accommodating condominiums, apartment buildings, office buildings. So you get that multi-purpose use. And a lot of people aren't using automobiles to get downtown anymore. Okay. They're finding other ways to get down here. They're using transit. They're using active transportation. They're using Uber. And uh, it, it's been a... Uh, a much needed change in the way that the city travels. All right, let's go to City Hall. Okay. So Hill, I also like to point out that I'm, I always feel comfortable riding on 2nd Street because traffic is never going fast here. It's going about 12 to 15 miles an hour typically Yeah. because there's a lot of pedestrian cross traffic, there's multiple stops on short blocks, mm -hmm. and it just it slows everything down to a human pace. Yeah. All right, let's uh, head on down to Guadalupe and take a left. So Hill, we're, we're at Guadalupe here, and so this is an example of, you know, that wide, multi-lane, one-way street, mm -hmm. and so this gives us an idea of what many of these streets that, uh, you know, were transformed looked like before. That's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, Strodes, basically. Yeah. Street roads, high traffic, even though it should only be 35 miles an hour, people going much faster. Um, lot of uh, disruption on the street because of construction, uh, various projects that will go down to two lanes at various points. Yeah. And uh, you really, you, you, you've got to stay on the ball. Yeah. All right, so Hill, we uh, we made our way to City Hall. <laughs> as, as as they say, if you want to have anything really done in a city, uh, you better have some support from City Hall. That's right. Uh, talk a little bit about what communities can learn from the Austin experience in terms of being able to mobilize support within the community to help City Hall along, because you know ultimately politicians need to know that, gosh. 
somebody's got their back if they make some bold decisions and re uh, redesign and replan uh, and transform our city streets and our public realm. We just saw Second Street. We just saw Third Street. Those were redesigns. It takes a lot of political will. So talk a little bit about that process of, of over the decades of what yeah. Austin went through from an experience. Well, I, I think it's a great example of Austin has great civic engagement, that mm -hmm. there are a lot of people in the city that care deeply about the community and all aspects of the community, that, that everybody thrives, is economically stable, um, has good employment, has a good place to live, and it's been increasingly challenging in Austin the last 10, 15 years um, because of the growth that we have experienced because it's such an attractive place. We've had a lot of high-tech employers move to the city, so it's really changed the dynamic in the city. But it, but I think what, what our city leadership appreciates as much as anything is the relationships that the community develops, specifically advocates that are willing to have conversation to continually let our city leadership, city council, um, the mayor, and even people that are not elected offices, pe people that are working for the city, building relationship by having, how, how can we help the city be successful? Sure. And I think a great example of that is when we're looking at bicycle facilities in the city, Shoal Creek was a great example. Shoal Creek had gone through multiple iterations of having bike facilities on them, all of them totally inadequate, unsafe, unusable, um, people were getting hurt on them on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And people in the neighborhood were frustrated by the way that, that cyclists behaved on this facility because there was not a clear delineation for this is where the cyclist should be operating their vehicle safely. And now we have a great facility, but the reason that that happened is there was a lot of advocacy to the city council, we need this facility because it's one of the key north-south connectors in the city. But then we went out and spoke to the neighborhoods as well. Knocked on a lot of doors. Literally every door along Shoal Creek was knocked on. A lot of conversations were had. There was still some virulent opposition to this bicycle facility, but the vast majority of people that lived along Shoal Creek embraced it and said, absolutely, I want the kids, I want the families to have a safe place to ride their bicycles on Shoal Creek Boulevard because it's a neighborhood and people should be able to do that. And so I think it's that building a trusting relationship with our city leadership and they want to hear this is what we think we need in our neighborhood. This is what we need to connect our different parts of the city. So just continual dialogue that's respectful, that's informed, and that's patient. Because I think that's one of the, the, the realities of what we deal with when we're talking big infrastructure projects in the city. They take time. Right. You know, everybody wants to see it done tomorrow, but a lot of these projects have taken decades. But it's because of the gentle pressure relentlessly applied by a lot of people that care about the city. We keep moving these things forward and that's why we're successful. Let's speak a little bit to um, education and awareness uh, and how important it is for not only the politicians to, to become educated and, and get some awareness and appreciation for a different way of doing things, yeah. but then also city staff being able to, you know, to understand uh, you know, what it means to build a best-in-class city yeah. that is truly welcoming to all ages and abilities regardless of their mode of mobility. Yeah. Well, as, as I said earlier, I think it's a learning process for everybody. Mm -hmm. The advocates are learning, the city staff is learning, the engineers that design these facilities are learning. So it's build, test, and iterate again. Do it over and over. Keep refining it. And, and I think that's one of the great things about the Austin Transportation Department is they are devoted to building great facilities. And sometimes we don't get a great facility, you know. Sometimes there's physical constraints that keep it from happening. Sometimes it's just like, oh, I didn't think of that. And somebody from the city or, or one of the citizens from the city will go to Nathan Wilkes at, at Austin Transportation and go, Nathan, what about if you did it this way? Or just to give them feedback on this is not working for me and my family. So it's that, that constant dialogue that's really healthy and I think that, that people need to have the confidence that, that our city staff and our city leadership want to hear from us so they understand what's going on in the city. Take us back a few years uh, you know, to 
some of those initial efforts to uh, to bring that awareness to 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 like the city uh, leadership and uh, you you mentioned earlier the Green Lane project from People for Bikes yeah and uh, as I understand it there were some pretty groundbreaking study tours that took place yeah. uh, over over to Europe That's including right. having some city council members uh, attend how how much of of that is part of the the story that other cities can learn from in terms of being able to help get their le city leadership out of their little bubbles of, of their communities. You bet. Well, I, I think that's one of the most phenomenal things that People for Bikes has brought to the table is they have recognized that there are model implementations in international cities around the world. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Netherlands is one of the primary ones. Mm -hmm. So they initiated a study tour. They took three city council members. They took the city manager. Uh, they took a one of the leadership people from Capital Metro and other people from other cities as well so that they can collaborate, they can talk about common challenges and support each other in, in developing ways to meet the challenge of building active transportation. And I talked to all of these people when they came back from the Netherlands and they're just astonished because they've been out there on the bicycles with thousands of other people on a 40 degree drizzly afternoon and there are thousands of people using bicycles for transportation. You've got mom with two kids and a tuba and her groceries coming home from school and it's just, you see that it's possible and you think, why can't we do that in Austin? Yeah. And I think it just, it opens up those possibilities. The imagination runs wild and it's really exciting. Another great example was the fire chief was mm -hmm. taken over to the Netherlands and yeah. he saw how they have developed new equipment to meet the constraints that they have in the big cities in the Netherlands, Amsterdam specifically. Mm -hmm. So they have these tiny little narrow fire trucks mm -hmm. that are nimble and quick and can get into constrained places but still meet the needs of, of addressing fire and emergency situations. And he's like, why are we driving these huge 50 ton vehicles all over town yeah. and our streets are getting smaller and more crowded and and it's hard to to take care of things that way yeah so yeah. new way of operating and so that study tour was in 2019 and during yeah. that study tour was really when the decision came forth uh to uh you know try to pull together uh, a future bond for the yeah. 2020 election. Yeah. Um, l let's wrap us up here in front of City Hall talking about that 2020 bond, that election, uh, how important that was because it wasn't just one bond, it was two separate bonds. Two big bonds. Two big bonds yeah. and you know, part of the, the thought process was do we do this? Do we try to do two big bonds at you the bet. same time? The answer was yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And the reason the answer was yes is because the community advocated for it strongly. Yeah. We were so insistent that there had to be an active transportation bond that was adjacent to the big light rail bond. Seven billion dollars advocated for light rail. And we said, that's wonderful, but light rail is not successful unless it has active transportation to support it. If you can't get to the train station safely, you're not going to use the train. So how do we build the sidewalk infrastructure, the bike lane infrastructure, how do we create that in tandem with this new multi-billion dollar light rail package? And we advocated for a multi-million dollar, hundreds of millions of dollars, $450 million mm -hmm. for active transportation. And it was a struggle because there are a lot of interest, old school interest still in Austin that think the only way to get around in Austin is in an automobile with your air conditioning turned all the way up but we proved them differently. And that bond passed by 67%. And I think that's the changing demographic in Austin that young people are saying, the car should not be the primary way of traveling in our city. We yeah. have to have alternatives to getting into an automobile. Yeah. And uh, the total bond price for that one was uh, $720 million. Uh, and some of that was also to some major uh, high risk, uh, you know, unsafe intersections that needed yeah. to be dealt with. So there was some that was uh, earmarked specifically for automobile infrastructure. Uh, yeah. and, and so th that's the reason for the difference, the 450 and the 720. Yeah, it was well balanced, no yeah, doubt it about very, it. Very and, well. and at first, a couple of our city council members said, we cannot afford 
mm -hmm. to have an active transportation bond. It will jeopardize the light rail bond. Mm -hmm. But it turns out that there were more people in favor of the active transportation bond than they were the light rail bond. But both passed resoundingly. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Hill, is there anything we haven't yet covered today that you want to leave the audience with? Well, I, I think it just, the, the thing that I will stress to anybody that's interested in seeing change happen in their city is, it is a long-term process. It requires just staying on it. And there's gonna be frustrations, there's gonna be setbacks, there's gonna be a lot of people that will not support your vision, but it's the ability to stay with it and persist that will result in success. Good. What are you gonna be doing in your retirement? <laughs> you know, I honestly don't know that. A, a good friend asked me that yesterday. And you know, uh, I've got a, a, lot of a lot of interest in renewable energy now. Okay. So I, I've uh, reached out to a couple of different groups in Central Colorado that are working on renewable energy, taking a lot of the, uh, the uh, federal money that's gonna be available to build out solar, wind power, because we need to make a transition to other ways to power our communities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's uh, solar powered uh, e-bikes right. right here. Well, that's <laughs> in my house, we have solar panels. We have not paid an electricity bill in seven years. Yeah. And we drive a plug-in hybrid as well as pedal assist bicycles. Yeah. So we're, we're traveling free. Yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. It's fun. That's great. Hill, thank yeah. you so very John, much. My I pleasure. appreciate it. Thank Yay. you. All right. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.